Okay, so we're gonna go over um, variable types and arrays. So what I'd like for you to do is to uh, go to notebook three, open that up. And while you're doing that, let's talk about what a Python alias is, okay? Because um, this is one of the issues that comes up in homework three that they ask you to use math or something. But the problem is, uh, as you can see in notebook three, in the very first initialization code, they say import numpy as mp. Okay, so then mp is the alias. And in other words, we'll be able to do np mean, np.mean, right? Anytime we want to use np.mean, numpy.mean. Sorry, I can't write very well with the mouse. And why am I telling you this? Well, because there are import statements in the initialization code and it lets you know what things you have available. So we've got NumPy available. That's what we're, we're telling. And they're telling us, hey, you can use this alias for it. We've imported NumPy as NP, which lets us know it's alias. Okay, so let's move forward. All right, so we're gonna start a quick review of tables with the skyscrapers data set. And we're just gonna remind ourselves of a few key uh, table methods. And well, let's get started. All right, so sorry, go to the course calendar and in course calendar, let's click on notebook three and I'll pause it while it's loading. And here you go, here is the initialization code. And again, this is the import that we're talking about. Also, the data science is imported right above it. Um, and so that is a, a helpful thing to check at times to see what's there. Sorry, let me get my mouse back. Okay, so I'm going to initialize that. Um, and here we are with our review of tables. So please notice that we always use this table.read table. Why? Because the skyscrapers.csv file is in the same folder as the notebook that we're working on. So this table.read table says, hey, I'm gonna give you a file name and you go into the same folder that we're in and we find this file name, please load it as this table called skyscrapers. And the show five, of course, is gonna show us five rows. And now we're just going to look at the name and the height. Okay, so dot select, I get to pick whatever columns I would like. Notice it'll put them in that order. If I did height and then name, it would be, and it just puts them in the other order. Now that's not what they wanted, so I'm going back. But again, select we'll put the columns in whatever order I specify. Okay. Um, and then notice that we can do the same thing as selecting two columns by dropping three columns. If we drop the three columns that are not name and height, we get the same place. So notice that again, dot select, we'll choose a subset of the table with only those two columns in it and dot drop, is the opposite, it will drop any column that I name. Okay, so now we're just back to the skyscrapers. And we're doing a dot where uh, the city is Los Angeles. Okay, and by the way, I'll just point this out again, r dot um, equal to, okay, equal underscore to. So, the computer assumes that you're doing r dot equal to. Sorry, I got a, uh, I didn't get an underscore, got a dash there. This is the exact same thing, the exact same table. And please notice that if I just leave out the r dot equal to and just say city comma Los Angeles, put that in text, put that text in quotes, boom, this is what I get. So I'm just letting you know that the predicate r dot equal to is always assumed. And if I'm using just r dot equal to where the city is equal to specific text, I can just put the text in and I don't have to explicitly name the predicate. 
Okay, so that's, that's a little help um, to using dot where, and we're doing the exact same thing, dot where the name is equal to, r dot equal to Empire State Building, boom. Now they're going back to where the city is, New York City. Uh, we've seen this one before, and sort based on completed. So that's going to put the earliest completed skyscrapers um, first. And this, if we want to see the most recent skyscrapers, if we want the years to be sorted from most recent to um, most the oldest buildings, the newest buildings to the oldest buildings, remember, we do the sort with a comma descending equals true. And here it shows us the most recently completed um, skyscrapers in New York City. Here are the Chicago skyscrapers. Again, where city, comma, and you don't have to put the r.equal dot equal to, just put where city, comma, Chicago. Okay, and you can see them. We do have 26 rows omitted, so there are 36 skyscrapers in Chicago. And now they're saying, hey, where the material is steel, and they want to sort, again, descending equals true on completed is going to give us the most recent steel skyscrapers, okay? Sorry, it says the Chicago is not uh, defined, which means I probably didn't. Yep, the, the problem was I had not executed this code block up here. So it was it didn't know what Chicago was. Now that it knows what Chicago was, it is getting all of the steel skyscrapers. And the most recent ones are first. So the most recently completed one, steel skyscrapers, 1974, was completed in 1974, the Willis Tower, and so on. Okay, so that's just a quick review of how to use dot where, dot sort, dot select, and dot drop. So let's talk about let's talk about different numbers and the way Python refers to them. There are two types of numbers uh, in Python. We can either have an integer or a whole number. Remember, integers are positive and negative whole numbers and the zero or floats. These are real numbers, okay? That's what they mean by float, okay? So it's not that big a deal and it's not that hard to tell in Python, but let's just show what's going on. So if I add two integers, I get an integer, okay? Now here I do a division. Sorry, let me get rid of that stray red mark, okay. And whenever I have a decimal place, whenever Python uses a decimal place, it's saying, hey, I'm storing the number as a float. I'm storing it as a real number. And whenever it does division, it will always store the answer as a float, even though sometimes an integer divided by an integer happens to be an integer. Okay. Now, this one is interesting. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 raised to the 50th power. Okay, and notice that it stores it as an integer. It is an integer, and it stores it as an integer. Okay, um, and notice this one, if I want to force it to be a, a real number, which Python calls a float, if I want it to be a float, all I have to do is put a decimal place in the number, and then it'll switch to scientific notation. It's still a real number either way. Um, why? Because one of the values was entered as a real number. When I put in that decimal place, it says, hey, Python, this means I'm entering a real number. And notice that if I just do the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 squared, it is, in fact, the answer is an integer. And, of course, 4 divided by 700 is a real number, is a float, as is four divided by whatever that is, 700 billion or whatever that number is. Oh wait, times 10 to the 18th. I don't even want to think about that. Um, but I think it's something like quadrillion, but oh well. Um, now what's going on here? This is weird. It rounds this number, why? Well, 
the computer has a certain amount of space for a number and this number in green above has just exceeded that okay so when i hit enter and put it into the computer the computer saves all of it that it can notice it doesn't round it properly that's a nine there so this should actually round up oh wait it does round i'm sorry it does it's rounding here six seven eight it rounds the seven up to an eight and it stops here okay is that a big deal no but notice this i take this number and then subtract the one below it here and it comes out as zero why because it stored the larger number as this shorter decimal why it just didn't have room and so it thinks the answer here is zero what's important about this the importance of this is that when i subtract two nearly equal numbers the computer can get it wrong due to rounding error and uh, again, because it can't store the whole decimal, okay? 10 raised to the one half power, this is the square root of 10, okay? It is a float, a real number, okay? The square root of, the square root of 16 is in fact four, but notice that when I'm doing a square root and the 0.05, I, it does put the answer as a float, as a real number even though we all know that four is an integer, okay? And now look at this, the square root of 10 squared. And notice it has this little thing over here. Now the square root of 10 squared, mathematically we know is just 10, just the integer 10. Again, this is going back up to the one up here. And again, when two numbers are very, or when a number is very, very close to zero, um, I, I end up losing some decimal place accuracy. And this is the rounding error that happens. The computer does the square root and stores as many digits and decimal places as it can. And then it tries to square it, multiplies those two things together. And it doesn't come out to exactly 10, as we know it should. Just letting you guys know that. 30 divided by 10, notice that the answer is stored as a float, as a real number. Watch this, though. If I say integer int of this expression, right? So it's the same exact expression as this one up here. So the answer is going to be three. But if I put this int function in, right, then the answer is three, sorry, three. What's happening? Well, int is a function that says, hey, take whatever is inside here and turn it into an integer. Okay, so I can do 26 divided by 9, which is 2.88888. And if I do the integer of that, oh, notice that it didn't round correctly, right? If I round that properly, that should have rounded up to 3. So int is a really good function, and it will take a number like this and turn it into an integer. But what does it do? It just truncates. It just chops off at the decimal place and gets rid of everything to the right and leaves it with two. So it is not rounded properly if I use int. That's all that we're trying to get across there, okay? Um, float three, okay, so three is an integer, but if I do float three, it becomes a, it stores it as a real number. You can see it because there's the decimal place there. Six divided by four is a real number, so it's a float. Six divided by 4,000 is also a real number. And notice this is funny because despite the fact that we have a big ugly number, well actually this is a small and ugly number, right? Because it's times 10 to the negative 56. So this is very, very close to zero, but then I multiply it by one times um, the same number basically. Um, then, Sorry, I multiply this by this. That's what we have. And what happens? Well, because we put, um, well, the answer is six. We're undoing it. And this time it comes out exactly right. Okay. Um, notice that if I had done the division of six by 
1.5 times 10 to the negative 56th. Um, <laughs> check that out. Why? Well, remember, if I divide by a number less than one, then the answer actually gets bigger. Okay, so we're actually dividing by something very, very close to zero. So the answer to that division problem is much bigger than six. Okay, and here's a variable called x. And when I do two times x, I get 10. Okay, now I'm changing x to be equal to three and y equals four, but it's not the number four, it's the text four and z is the text 5.6. Now notice, integer y. Okay, that works. Why? Well, because it is an integer. This is not the number four, this is the character four. Well, integer y takes the character four and turns it into an integer, which is a number. Notice that the integer z has got a problem, right? Because if it takes the text and converts it to a number, it's still not an integer. Right, so this thing is confused. So I can do float 5.6. This is say, hey, take this and turn it into a real number. So it drops the string. It drops the quotation marks and turns the string into a real number. And if I do int of the float of the text 5.6, I get the number five. All right, and I can round 5.6. Also to let you know, um, this tells me the number of decimal places to round to. So it was actually rounding to this third decimal place, but you'll notice that there were all zeros in there. So the answer it put is 2.0. It kept it as a real number, but it put the answer as 2.0. And then 10 times 3.0. So the 3.0 is a float. So the answer is going to be a float. Okay, so that's just how we refer to numbers, right? We've got integers and we've got, uh, which we, Python refers to as int, and we have real numbers, which Python refers to as float. Okay, so now we can look at text. Awesome. Um, they have a slightly different version of 99 bottles of whatever is on the wall, but okay, 99 bottles of root beer. Okay, and that's gonna be our string for the moment. Okay, and sorry, let me get the cursor back. Now 99 is still text. This is not the number 99. This is the character nine and then a nine. Baby Yoda is a string. Notice this, it is almost doesn't matter whether I use single quotes or double quotes. Why do I am I allowed to use both? Well, what if there is a quotation mark? See, here's a contraction inside this that's going to use a single quote between the N and the T. But if I use double quotes for my string, it gets the whole thing. If I try to use single quotes, it gets confused, right? So let me, you don't have to do this. I'm just showing if this were single quotes then it freaks out because it thinks that the string is only from baby Yoda isn't, you know, it doesn't have, I mean, it thinks of that as an apostrophe T. Okay, but when I use the double quotes, it works correctly, it works properly, and there you go. Same thing, if I need to get a quotation, inside my string, I can use the single quotes, then the double quotes will show up as a string. Okay, baby Yoda isn't Yoda. This is kind of funny. I can add two words and straw plus berry is strawberry. It's called concatenation. Notice that even though the computer can figure out how to add two strings, it can't figure out what to do with a number plus a string. Okay, so that's why the type error down here says unsupported for integer and string, okay? Strawberry plus, notice that we're just adding a space in the middle. Okay, boom, it can do straw space berry. 
Look at this. Hot times 10. Ha ha ha. L-O. I, I did this one. L-O times 5. L-O, L-O, L. Okay, so it can at times interpret a multiplication times a string, and it'll just repeat the string that many times. Okay. So we're gonna talk about types of variables. Okay. And so height, this make array, notice that these are text, right? This is not 16 meters, 17 meters. It, it's the text, 16M, and the text, 17M, okay? Sorry, I was trying to show that, and I was failing, okay? And height item two, remember item two is here. Why? Because item zero is gonna be 16 meters. You can see that, just put in the zero. Oops, sorry. Item zero, wait, sorry, height, item zero. And you can see that item zero is 16 meters, so item one will be 17 meters. So item two, in fact, is gonna be the 18 meters. So item is really helpful to get, to get entries out of an array, but remember the computer starts counting at zero. So what we think of as the first item is actually item zero. What we think of as the third item is actually item two. And notice that when we say type, type tells us the type of variable it is. And it's saying, hey, that's a string. And when we say what type of variable is height, well, height is this array. So it says, hey, it's, a, um, it's an array, ND array. Um, in height. Okay, and if a is equal to 10, I'm going to do type a, it's an integer. And if I ask it type of 4.5, that's a float because it's a real number. Type of ABC is string. Type of skyscrapers, which is the table we loaded up above, is in fact a table. And notice that it refers to this data science package, which we imported because Tables have a very special role to play in that data science package. And the fact that it's a data science table means that we can do all of those data science methods to it. Now, what in the world is a bool? <laughs> okay, so a Boolean function is one that can either be true or false. Okay, uh, computers think of this as zero or one. Uh, we think of it as true or false, true equals zero, excuse me, true equals one, false equals zero. And the type of abs, this is a built-in function or method for absolute value, as is in P round. Now, if I do type of round 3.4, it rounds the 3.4 and I have an integer. If I do MP round, it actually saves it as a float. Okay, so notice that the round function is a little different, works a little differently than the MP round. MP round always saves it as a real number, whereas plain round saves it as an integer. Not that big a deal, but it is something to notice. And the type of T-H-R-E-E -E is in fact a string, and the type of three is an integer. Okay, so now we're ready to get into arrays and review a little bit about how to make them and work with them. Okay, so make array. This is one of the most important functions that we have. And it says, hey, whatever I put in parentheses, I want you to turn it into an array for me. And the computer obliges. And if you want to see what it looks like, just type out my array. And there we go. We have an array. One, two, three, four. And if I multiply an array by two, what does it do? It multiplies each individual number by two. So the first entry is gonna be two, and then two times two is four, and then three times three, three times two, I'm sorry, is six, and four times two is eight. Okay. And now it'll take the square root, but again, it's, um,
it's taking the square root of of this, right? Excuse me, square root. What am I talking about? This is squaring. It's squaring everything. So it's it's going back to my array. Sorry, I knew that was a mistake, and I kept saying it anyway. And then 2 squared is 4, and 3 squared is 9, and 4 squared is 16. That's what we've got going on here. My array plus 1. Well, remember, we're back to my array. What does it to plus 1 do? It just adds 1 to each entry in my array. And this point is that I haven't changed my array yet. Okay, so they're saying, hey, what about if I make another array? Same thing, make array with these four numbers. And then my array plus another, okay. It's just added one to 60 and two to 70 and three to 80 and so on. Yet another. Okay, so what about my array plus yet another? What's the problem? Well, my array had four entries. Yet another only has three, right? And there, and it's, it's saying, wait, wait, wait. I've got an array with length four and an array with length three, and I can't do this operation with it. I can't take... Um, I can't add element to element, so that's why it's throwing an array. So functions on arrays. So one of the big reasons that we choose to use arrays is because Python can do math on them. So length of my array, like we said, it, there were three things in my array. And I can use the sum. And it adds up the 1, the 2, the 3, and the 4. So 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10. So it is, in fact, giving us the sum of my array. And if I take the sum of my array divided by the length of my array, I actually have the average. Okay. Um, sorry. So there it is. There's the sum of my array divided by the length of my array, which is the formula for finding the average. But why is average not working? Well, it's not defined, but that's why we have NumPy. And NumPy was imported with this alias MP, so boom. And sorry, that was the uh, <laughs> that was the t the the code right below it. And then another, we have this make array, same another as before. And then remember the length of yet another. This was the one that threw the error code earlier, and it is only three things. Now tuna is going to be an array of text where we have Bluefin, Albacore, and Jim. Okay, and it's fine with that, but it can't sum the tunas. Why? Well, because it's text. It doesn't really know what to do necessarily to add the text. Okay, and again, make array one more time. And this is why I said that it's so important that we can do math on arrays because the columns of tables are arrays and there are a lot of times where we can't do the math on the table that we want to do. So we're going to the San Francisco skyscrapers, how we're using dot where city is San Francisco. So this SF table is just all of the skyscrapers in San Francisco. And if I want to do something with the height, right, then I have to do sf.select height but these aren't an array. There's, I can't do anything on this. But this is where the dot column method comes in. And this is important. So what does dot column do? Instead of pulling the table, excuse me, pulling uh, one column of the table into a smaller table like select does, dot column actually creates an array. And so now the numbers are pulled out where I can actually do some math on it. So now that I have the heights as a column, right, I can get this, this array feet, and I just take the sf.column height and multiply by 3.28. So it's going to convert all of these meters up here in the height array into feet. Okay, then it's gonna create a new table. And it's going to be the old table, SF, with column. And this with column is a nice way to add 
a column to our table and it's going to be right here. Its title is going to be height and feet. And then feet is an array that's going to have all of the column entries in it right here. Okay. So when I execute this code block, I get a new table which has this column that we wanted to add to it. And what it's done is it's taken the height in meters and converted it to height in feet for each of the numbers. So 237.44 meters is approximately equal to 779 feet. Okay, so now going back to the San Francisco table, we can also use numbers. We don't have to use the name. Okay, so this is in fact the name and it works the same as if I had typed in name. Boom, see it doesn't change the output down here at all. So I can either use the, the title of the column or I can just use its number. Remember the computer starts counting at zero. And this finds the average height of the skyscrapers in San Francisco, but this is in meters, okay? And now we've switched to LA sky skyscrapers, right? We've just used a dot where city is Los Angeles. Okay, so here's LA. And, oh wow, we can see which city has the higher average skyscraper. Why? So LA.column height, that's going to that's going to bring the height column out as an array, and then I can do the NP average and find the average of the LA skyscrapers. And then the same thing here, the dot column is going to bring the height column out as an array out of the San Francisco skyscrapers, and then we're taking the MP average, then we're subtracting the average. And so it turns out that on average, the LA skyscrapers are about 4.6 meters taller, 4.62545 meters taller. Okay, and then they're just showing a single one of these, right? What is it doing? It's just grabbing that column, that height column from the LA skyscrapers and taking the average of all of the skyscrapers in LA that are in the table. All right, so New York City skyscrapers. Righty. And then we can see that the skyscrapers in New York are taller than the ones in LA. Why? Well, because I had a positive number. If I'm subtracting this real number minus this real number, then if I get a positive number, the first one is bigger. It's just like saying, if I do 10 minus 5, I get 5. If the smaller number is first and I do 5 minus 10, I get a negative number. But this number is positive, and that means what? It means the New York skyscrapers, on average, have a taller height. Not NY skyscrapers. Now look at this. This we Remember, it always defaults to R dot equal to. But now we're using r dot not equal to. So this is going to pick up every single skyscraper in the table that's not got New York City. Okay. Um, and when we do that, we see this. And only LA and New York City notice this, the r dot contained in. Oh, my. So what R dot contained is it says, look, if the value in city is included in any of this, if it's included in Los Angeles, if it's included in New York City, then we're going to take that row. If it's not, we're going to leave it out. So this gets us the New York City and uh, LA skyscrapers um, and just um, <laughs> just to show that, let me, um, I don't know, take 70. Oh, that one's still in New York. I was looking for one that would be in LA so I could show you that there they are. Okay. So <laughs> there are LA, um, skyscrapers in here. So 
anyway, let me just get rid of that. I was just trying to take a certain row so we could see, um, because right now all we can see is the New York City skyscrapers. But the LA skyscrapers are in there. And then where the city are not contained in, this is gonna be everything but LA and New York. And you can see we have Chicago and Vegas and Atlanta, okay? And ny.column three, its length is 73. What does this mean? It just means that there are 73 skyscrapers in New York. And another way to get at this is I can say the table name dot num rows. And both of them give me the same thing. Notice that that's for New York. In Chicago, there's only 36 skyscrapers, okay? Okay, so we've pretty much gone over all of this. There are some important array, excuse me, some important mathematics that we want to do, but these are only going to work on arrays, right? So that's why we make arrays, or since the column of tables are array, we use the dot column method to pull it down into an array, and then we can find its length or round it or find the max or min or take the sum, take the average. So again, please remember that we need to extract the data that's in a column into an array and we use the dot column method to do that. Okay, and then we're just going to review a couple of the important visualizations. Dot scatter produces a scatter plot, dot hist produces a histogram, dot bar h is a horizontal bar chart and dot box plot. Also remember the dot group method because that is extremely, extremely helpful, okay? Okay, so what's going on here? Um, we're creating a scatter plot, okay? And we're adding a label. This is not stuff you guys have to do. This is stuff that's going to be recorded for you. And this compares LA to NYC. Why? Well, let me just go up here and show you, right? When we're looking here, this is color equals red. And so for the New York skyscrapers, we're gonna see those as a red dot. And then for the LA skyscrapers, you see this color equals dark blue. We're gonna, so dark blue, is New York skyscrapers and red is LA. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. New York is red and LA is dark blue. There are far more skyscrapers in New York than there are in LA. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we're doing the same thing. Um, and we're going to do box plots this time. Okay, so what is a box plot? Notice that there are one, two, three, four, five vertical lines in a box plot. So we have the minimum and the maximum. Now it doesn't mark the maximum way up here. It marks the maximum or the minimum if there weren't any outliers. And then it marks everything that's an outlier with that little circle dot, okay? So this is the median, all right? And then these numbers are quartiles, all right? So the bottom one is the 25th percentile. So down here is the 25th percentile, and up here is the 75th percentile. And that's what a box plot is. It just shows the min, the max, the median, and the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. So it actually breaks the data up into quarters or quartiles, to use the statistics word. Okay, and by the way, what do I do? That, it's rather complicated. We're not, we're not gonna have to do big uh, code blocks like this, but just the dot box plot is what we use, is the method we use, okay? And there's a little bit to it. Here's some more box plots comparing NYC and LA. And notice that there are much taller, um, much taller skyscrapers in New York compared to LA. Okay. Now we're going to 
group based on city. So let me actually throw in a comment why I just want to show you this group. Remember what the grouping does. The grouping just gives me a count. Well, Atlanta has eight skyscrapers and Chicago has 36. Okay, so the next thing is, what does the sort do? Sort based on counts. So it's sort based on this column with descending equals true is going to put the cities that have the most skyscrapers at the top. So there you go. New York City has the most, followed by Chicago, and then Houston, and then Los Angeles. And Atlanta is in the top five for this table, but way at the bottom of the top five. Okay. And then what? Well, the bar h dot city. So it says, hey, make a bar chart, horizontal bar chart using the city column. Well, it's going to, each one of these categories is going to be along the x axis. And this count number is how tall the bars are going to be. I'm sorry, let me delete the hashtag so you can see this. And this is called a Pareto bar chart with the tallest, with the, the longest bars at the top. So again, um, nice, we, I mean, let me just say this. We use this all the time. After I do a group, a lot of times I'll sort with descending equals true and then use bar H. Why? Because it gives me a nice chart of the greatest down to the least. Okay. Now notice this, where count r above five. So now it's gonna do the same exact thing, but we've thrown this dot where in here, that the count has to be above five. We also haven't sorted it. So we don't have this from least to greatest. This just goes back to the original skyscrapers and does the same thing, but only counts city, cities that have um, five or more skyscrapers. Okay, and here, what are we doing? Same thing, we're grouping based on city and we're keeping the um, numbers above five, the counts above five. And then we're doing a bar graph based on city, but we're just adding some titles plots title, label title, and so forth. So again, this isn't that important, but it does help make the graphic a lot more pleasant to look at. Now what's going on here? Counts are above seven now, okay? And notice Atlanta is in here. And now what are we doing? Oh my goodness, same R dot above seven, but we're doing the sort with the descending equals true and then the bar H, which gives me this descending order of, uh, of counts, okay? And this one, look what the sort is. It's the sort based on city instead of count. So it puts Atlanta at the top because now it's sorting city alphabetically. So Atlanta and then Chicago and then Houston and then Los Angeles and then New York City. Okay. The last thing we're gonna look at is ranges and this NPA range. So first of all, let's make this array zero through six, all the whole numbers, zero through six. And then look at NPA range. So NPA range, by the way, this is not the word a range. It's the word a range, <laughs> right? The English word a range would have two R's in it and we get an error because the computer doesn't know what that is, but it does know a range. It starts counting at zero, it counts by ones, and it goes up until one less than the stopping criteria. So. If I do MPA range seven, it'll have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. It always stops one before the stopping criteria. Now I can, I don't have to start at zero. I can, if I put in two arguments, the first one is the start criteria and the second one is the stop criteria. And you can see, I do get three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It stops one before. Okay, now what does this do? This negative one says, hey, I want you to count backwards. I want you to start counting at 15 and count down to seven. And it does, right? Except it stops one item before it gets to the stopping criteria. And then NPA range one to 21 
count by twos. Okay, so this is going to be all the odd numbers, right? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Notice that it stops one increment below the 21. NPA range 0 to 21, count by twos. Well, if I start at 0, this is going to be all the even numbers. And notice that the 20, it'll stop right before it gets two or bigger than the stopping criteria. Okay, so MPA range, it will count by smaller numbers. So notice here, it's going to count from 0 to 1.00, right? One unit below the 1.01. .01, and it counts by this tiny little 0 0.01, 1 100th. Okay, um, NPA range seven, it always, if you don't say what to start at, it says I'll start at zero and I'll count by ones up until one before whatever number you put in. Now, the interesting thing is this actually has seven numbers. Okay, so if I wanna take say, um, the first seven rows of a table, I can do take NPA range seven and I will get seven rows because the computer starts counting at zero. Okay, um, and a item six. Now remember, this is item zero, right? So if I put in a zero here, I do get the zero. It turns out that the item numbers are in fact <laughs> uh, the numbers, right? And B item 49, that was this table up here with all the hundreds between zero and one. Okay, so MPA range is one of the most valuable functions that we have. Why? Because sometimes we want a list of numbers so that we can take a certain number of rows or columns, and uh, usually rows, um, and MPA range gives us a way to make an array. That's important, right, that this actually turns out to be an array but it makes an array of a specific kinds of numbers and it has a lot of flexibility um, to get done different tasks that we need to do.